Creemos nosotros que en América Latina en general, y muchos de nuestros países en particular, eh, han venido y siguen presentándose eh, una serie de políticas públicas, reformas de políticas y programas, no solo en el campo de las denominadas políticas sociales, sino también todas aquellas vinculadas al desarrollo, políticas de empleo, políticas y programas vinculados a, a la, al crecimiento económico, al crédito, este, realmente relevantes desde el punto de vista del devenir de nuestras sociedades. Y los debates muchas veces son interesantes, previos al diseño de, la, de estas políticas o estas iniciativas de política pública, muchas veces son lanzamientos comunicacionales muy relevantes y los debates son posteriores, pero en muchos casos, en gran parte de los casos, estos debates no permiten transparentar cuestiones de justicia social, de valores y de ética que están subyacen en, en, eh, en sus diseños, eh, en sus formulaciones, en sus implicancias, este, tanto desde el punto de vista de la participación o no de los distintos sujetos, la forma en que se negoció eh, el, esa política pública, eh, ¿qué es lo, cuáles son las implicancias en términos de la gestión o administración de recursos que son siempre escasos, eh, cómo son tenidos en cuenta eh, los intereses eh, y requerimientos de los distintos sectores sociales o regiones de un determinado país eh, que pueden verse satisfechos total, parcialmente o postergados frente a las decisiones de política pública que se toman. En los clásicos, particularmente en el mundo anglosajón eh, y, y fundamentalmente en los años que dieron lugar a la gestación del denominado, de los denominados estados de bienestar, los trabajos de Rawls y los debates más o menos con, eh, de quienes trabajan temas de contrato social estuvieron más presentes que hoy eh, en las discusiones en sistemas democráticos. Por lo tanto, yo creo que la preocupación eh, que muestra el trabajo que hemos intentado circular eh, de Severín es un intento de poner sobre la mesa algunas discusiones que nos parecen relevantes para enriquecer eh, una perspectiva que está, si no totalmente, por lo menos parcialmente olvidada y que nos parece sumamente relevante para enriquecer la discusión democrática y conceptual eh, de desarrollo, desarrollo humano en particular y política pública en nuestro país. Which hasn't been translated into Spanish yet, but hopefully it should be there very soon. And I will try to confront the argument of the book with concrete realities of injustice. The structure of the argument will be as follows I'll, um, I'll talk about the book and, say, and argue that the idea of justice constitutes a kind of revolution in development studies. And, and also for public policy. In the same way as John Rawls in the 70s and his theory of justice um, generated a revolution in political philosophy, this book, The Idea of Justice, is likely to generate the same impact as John Rawls in the 70s for development and public policy. And I will describe the book because many of you might not have read it, so I'll describe the argument of the book, saying that the idea of justice rests on two foundations, freedom and reasoning. And then I'll discuss the scope and limits of an idea of justice 
based on these two foundations of freedom and reasoning. And I will confront that idea of justice with real life situations of injustice. And then by doing that, I'll argue that if we want to think about justice in real life, we need to go beyond freedom and reasoning. Namely, we need a structural understanding of justice. And also that our conception of reasoning and public reasoning and democracy has to be rooted in a wider discussion of the good life. And I'll explain that um, in, in my talk. But that's the structure of the argument of, of, of my talk today. So I'll start with a very brief overview of the idea of justice, of how justice has been conceived in development so far. In the 1960s, justice was very much present in development, especially with the dependency theory that, um, that emerged here in Latin America. That the development model that Latin American countries were following was seen as unjust. It was unjust to, um, to export raw materials cheaply to, um, to Europe, to Western countries, and import um, high prices with, uh, of higher goods. So, hence the import substitution strategies. Whether these import substitution strategies were just or not is another issue. But justice was very much a concern of development in the 1960s. And then we have the oil crisis, the debt crisis, and the 1980s, and, um, and justice disappears from the development vocabulary. The dominant discourses of the day are about pro-poor growth, about participation, social capital, uh, empowerment, uh, poverty reduction. So development gets away from justice to talk about poverty, poverty reduction, empowerment participation. The 1990s, justice comes back into development, although not very much as justice, but in terms of human rights. <coughs> And, uh, and the Millennium Development Goals. So it is, it is unjust for a woman in the Congo to be more likely, to be a hundred times more likely to die of childbirth than a woman in the UK. It is unjust for a girl not to be able to go to school because she is a girl. Or it is unjust for someone to be in prison because he opposes the government. So human rights are part of the development discourse in the 1990s. And so justice enters the development discourse via the human rights. But the difference with the 1960s is that justice is no longer the product of structural relations. In the 60s, the dependency theory, it was the development was the development model wasn't just because of structural relations between Western countries and and developing countries. Today, justice is a matter of outcomes between individuals. It is unjust for an individual girl not to be able to go to school. It is unjust for a woman to die in childbirth. And you can think about other examples of uh, human rights violation in, in development. The idea of justice, the, the book of Sen, situates itself within that liberal tradition to thinking about justice. So justice, as we will see, is about individual outcomes, no longer about structural relations. And um, I'm not sure whether many of you have read Development as Freedom, but the idea of justice continues the argument of Development as Freedom. If you read the book, it's basically the same or very similar to Development as Freedom, that tried to uh, bring to the agenda another vision of development. That um, in, in development is freedom. Development is about expanding the freedoms that people have reason to value. It's not about incomes. It's about giving opportunities to people to live a life that that they value. To 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 be able to to live something meaningful and uh, and give them the opportunities to do that. But there is a big difference between the two books, although they are very similar. 
The idea of justice brings development to a matter of justice. So to, to, in, to enable people to live a life they value is a matter of justice. That it is unjust not to provide conditions for people to live a life they value. So it is a big revolution because it is the first time since the 1960s that justice is back so centrally in development discourses. So development is shifting very slowly from poverty reduction to justice. And even if a country may reduce its poverty rate by, let's say, 20%, even if the poverty rate is reduced from 40% to 20%, it doesn't mean that the country is more, more just. It might mean that you know, more, more people live above the poverty line. But is this, is this more, a more just situation is another matter. But my question is, well, how does the idea of justice fare in achieving what it is set to do, to provide a framework to remedy injustice? Is it good enough? And um, as I've only been in Argentina for three days, and it's my, my first time in Argentina, uh, I'd like you to think about three examples of public policy in Argentina that we will then uh, think about throughout this lecture and whether they are promoting justice. And um, so I would like maybe to spend two minutes um, for you to talk in, uh, to your neighbors to try to uh, come up with one example or two examples of, of public policy that you think has been the most important. As I had said before, the idea of justice is likely to have the same place in, um, in development as John Rawls. And the reason for, for this is, well, on the one hand, that the idea of justice provides the most robust alternative to a theory of justice to date. In political philosophy, you have a lot of critique of Rawls, either from the liberal position um, or from the proletarian position, but every, um, basically, almost any book published in political philosophy since 71 has engaged with Rawls, either you are for or against the theory of justice. But this book is said to provide an alternative to, to Rawls or even to the communitarian critique of Rawls. And um, also the book is written by an economist who is a very renowned development economist and um, so it is set to bring the idea to theories of justice outside political philosophy into the social sciences in a way that, that Rawls was maybe not able to do. So it is a massive, a massive um, innovation in social sciences to have really this robust alternative to a theory of justice. And the major thrust of the book, which has been made actually a few years ago in an article published in the Journal of Philosophy, is that we, all we need for justice is not what he calls a transcendental approach, but a comparative approach to justice. John Wall starts with the question, what is a just society? And then he tries to frame that idea, that theory of justice, you know, what is a just society? And for Rawls, a just society is one that follows its principles of justice and, um, and that distributes primary goods, if you're familiar with it. But um, uh, never mind. What, um, what, what matters for Sen is not to think about what is a just society. All we need to know is whether one situation is more just than another. So we don't need to know what a completely just society is. All we need to know is whether something is a bit better than something else. So, uh, you know, we might not know what, what would be a totally just society in Argentina, but we might be able to say that if more people are, um, are, have access to basic services, well, this is more just than a situation where no one has access to services. So we don't need to know um, what a just society is. It suffices to make comparisons whether one situation is better 
more just or worse than another. <coughs> and Sen uses his capability approach to make these comparative judgments. How to know whether A is better than B? Well, a situation is more just than another if more people in that situation enjoy more valuable freedoms. So if more people are able to live a life they value, if more people are given these opportunities, then the situation is more just than another. And, um, and the idea of justice is very much into liberalism, and I explain why, but I want to make a discretion on the capability approach because um, I was told that some of you know already a lot about the capability approach and others might, might not. So uh, who, just to, who knows about the capability approach? Only one. <laughs> the whole second cohort of the flash of masks know about this. <laughs> okay, so not, not that many. So what is in this capability approach that has made uh, Sen very famous? I mean, he was famous for other things as well, but uh, it is the capability approach that, that, um, you know, that Sen has been the most cited. Well, the capability approach emerged in economics as a critique of utilitarianism. Economic theory has been dominated for the last hundred years by the philosophical doctrine of utilitarianism according to which people's well-being is a matter of utility and, and preference satisfaction. So if you satisfy your preferences, whatever they are, you are, you are better off. 